They are stylish and beautiful, and in many cases, they are armed and active within Mexican cartels. La Cosa Nostra of Italy, the Bratva of Russia, the Yakuza of Japan, and the cartels of South and Central America, these infamous crime syndicates are typically led by fierce men at the top. But among the chaos and danger, there have been remarkable women who rose to the top of the cartel world, navigating a treacherous path paved with blood, sweat, and peril. We were all surprised that a female godmother was responsible for this much violence, could be this evil. Who are these formidable women who dared to claim the underworld's crown? What was their journey like? Join us in this thrilling episode as we uncover the most dangerous female narcos in history. Number 10, La Jefa. Enedina Arellano, Felix de Toledo, born on April 12, 1961, in Mazatlan, Sinaloa, is often considered the most dangerous female narco in history. Growing up in a family deeply entrenched in drug trafficking, her childhood dreams of becoming the Mazatlan Carnival Queen were shattered when her brothers, Ramon and Benjamin, became targets of both U.S. and Mexican authorities. As a teenager, Enadina enrolled at a private university in Guadalajara, Jalisco, where she earned a degree in accounting. By the mid-1980s, she was actively involved in her family's criminal empire, the Tijuana Cartel, managing finances and money laundering behind the scenes. Throughout the 1990s, the Tijuana Cartel was dominated by Enadina's six brothers. However, after a major blow in 2000 with the arrest of Jesus Labra Aviles, the cartel's financial mastermind, Enadina took the reins. By 2008, following the capture of her brother Eduardo, she officially assumed control of the cartel. With most of her brothers either imprisoned or deceased, Enadina maintained the cartel's operations, forging key alliances and leveraging her connections with Colombian drug suppliers. Her leadership marked a shift from her brother's violent methods to a more business-oriented approach. Known by aliases such as La Jefa, La Madrina, and La Narcomami, Enadina is one of the few women to have led a major criminal organization. In June 2000, the U.S. Department of the Treasury sanctioned her under the Foreign Narcotics Kingpin Designation Act, recognizing her influence and prominence in the world of organized crime. While La Jefa operated from the shadows, the next kingpin became the very public face of her drug empire, daringly operating under the nose of U.S. authorities who struggled to act against her for a long time. Number 9. The Queen of Cocaine In the late 1970s, while much of America was facing hard times, one city seemed to be thriving, Miami, Florida. But beneath its sunny skies and booming economy, there was a dark and dangerous secret. Griselda Blanco, known as the godmother of cocaine, was running a massive drug empire. She was responsible for smuggling tons of cocaine into the United States and ordering the deaths of many people. Even in a world full of dangerous criminals, it was shocking to discover that a woman was behind so much violence. Griselda came to the U.S. in 1974, fleeing from her war-torn homeland of Colombia. Starting at the bottom of the drug trade, she worked her way up to become one of the most powerful cocaine dealers in Miami working closely with the notorious Medellin cartel. Medellin, a city in Colombia, became rich and powerful because of drug money. Pablo Escobar, one of the most feared drug lords, owed much of his success to Griselda. Without her, some say there wouldn't have been Pablo Escobar. Griselda wasn't just any drug dealer, she was a visionary. She saw the growing demand for cocaine in the U.S. and seized the opportunity, becoming one of the first to smuggle large amounts into the country. At the height of her power, Miami was flooded with cocaine, and many Colombians lived in the city, working in the billion-dollar drug industry. But Griselda's empire was built on violence. She is believed to have ordered the deaths of dozens of people to protect her business. This level of bloodshed shocked many, especially because it was led by a woman. In some ways, Griselda Blanco helped build Miami with her illegal profits. Banks took her money and used it to loan to businesses, home buyers, and developers. In South Florida, there are countless properties worth over a billion dollars, all bought with dirty money. People whispered stories about cash being delivered in suitcases and paper bags to buy homes, creating a secret world of crime. Condos sprouted up all over Miami, almost like weeds in a garden. One day, the city looked one way, and the next day, it was filled with new buildings, changing everything. But beneath this shiny new city was a dark story. For over 10 years, police in Miami had been building a case against Griselda Blanco, a dangerous woman who ruled the drug trade. In 1982, she was accused of ordering the murders of three people in Dade County. The prosecutors had everything ready. 
Her former gang members were lined up to testify against her. They were ready to take her down. In 1994, they moved her from federal to state custody, preparing for the big trial. For four years, they worked on interviewing witnesses, but something went terribly wrong. The main witness, Jorge Ayala, who was Griselda's top hitman, got involved with one of the secretaries at the state attorney's office. It became a big scandal, with the news spreading all over Miami. The state attorney's office was embarrassed and several people lost their jobs because of it. Ayala, who was supposed to help convict Griselda, had ruined the case by getting distracted. With the key witness's credibility damaged, the prosecutors made deals, and Griselda Blanco ended up pleading guilty to lesser charges. Instead of spending her life in prison, she received a sentence of just 10 years. Some people thought it was all part of a grand plan, that Ayala had messed up on purpose to help Griselda. Whether it was true or not, no one knew for sure, but in the end, it worked out in her favor. In June 2004, after serving her time, Griselda Blanco was released and immediately deported back to Colombia. Many believed she wouldn't survive long. She had made too many enemies in her life. They thought as soon as she landed, she would be in danger, but they were wrong. The last anyone saw of her was in 2007 at Bogota Airport, and then she disappeared from sight. Years after Griselda vanished, another queen rose from the ashes. Number eight, the Queen of the South. Sebastiana Caton Vasquez once became one of the most powerful and feared women in Guatemala's political and criminal world. In a world where men like Pablo Escobar and El Chapo ruled, Sebastiana made her own name. Unlike many others, she wasn't born into a life of crime. Instead, she grew up poor, facing many struggles. Sebastiana lived in a small town near the Mexican border, where drug activity was everywhere. Her home life was full of fear. Her father was abusive and often hurt her and her mother. Watching this violence as a young girl left Sebastiana scarred and full of sadness. When Sebastiana turned 18, her life got worse. A man kidnapped her and forced her to be his wife. She had five children with him and suffered from his control and cruelty. Just like her mother, Sebastiana lived in constant fear and pain. Sebastiana Caton Vasquez had no choice but to focus on raising her five children as a single mother. Life was tough, with poverty and crime surrounding her. To support her family, she began selling goods under the table. It was a difficult time, and eventually she got pulled into the dangerous world of narcotics. Vasquez ended up marrying a local drug boss, Juan Alberto Ortiz Lopez, also known as Juan Chamale. It's unclear if she was forced into this marriage or not, but this marked a turning point in her life. Her new husband was a powerful drug lord in Guatemala, leading a major criminal organization. After Juan's arrest, Vasquez took over the operation, stepping into a rare role as a female cartel leader. While it's uncommon for women to lead in the narcotics world, there have been cases where wives take over after their husbands are arrested or killed, and Vasquez did just that. In no time, she turned the cartel into a massive operation, reportedly responsible for smuggling 40 tons of cocaine into Central America. Along with drug trafficking, she engaged in money laundering, disguising it as real estate ventures, and rose to prominence as one of the most powerful women in the narcotics trade. Over the years, Vasquez built strong connections with other criminal organizations. She allied with the Digna Cartel in Honduras, the Caloa Cartel in Mexico, and the Marjorie Shacon Roselle in Guatemala City. But then, as fate would have it, Marjorie was arrested in 2012 in the U.S. on drug trafficking and money laundering charges. And in a surprising twist, she cooperated with U.S. authorities, sharing insider information that helped dismantle parts of the criminal network. Vasquez saw her reign come to an end in October 2014 when she was captured by Mexican authorities, deported to Guatemala, and later extradited to the U.S. There, she agreed to testify against the Lauren Anas Gang, a group known for undermining women. In exchange for her testimony, Vasquez received a reduced sentence, while the Lauren Anas were sentenced to life in prison. Released in 2019, Vasquez reportedly returned to her hometown of Malacatan. It's unclear whether she resumed her criminal activities or chose a quieter life with her family and children. We've seen the Queen of Cocaine and the Queen of the South, but no list would be complete without this next queen. Number seven, Queen of the Pacific. Sandra Beltran was born on October 16, 1960, in Baja, California, Mexico, to Maria Luisa Beltran Felix and Alfonso Avila Quintero. Alfonso was connected to Rafael Caro Quintero, the feared leader of the Guadalajara cartel. Surrounded by luxury and danger from a young age, Sandra learned to count stacks of cash, 
and witnessed the drug world's brutal side, seeing her first shooting at just 13. Instead of joining the drug trade, Sandra studied communications at the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara. However, her dreams were shattered when she was kidnapped by her jealous cartel-connected boyfriend. This terrifying event opened her eyes to the cartel's power, leading her to leave school and dive into the drug business. Sandra quickly rose through the ranks, forming crucial alliances with powerful figures like Juan Mataballesteros and Alberto Cecilia Falcone. In 1984, Miguel Ángel Félix Gallardo used Sandra as a representative in a crucial meeting with the Cali cartel, but broke his promise to her. This led Sandra to look for new allies. Although the Arellano Felix brothers turned her down, Orlando Henao Montoya of the Norte del Valle cartel gave her a chance, supplying her with 200 kilograms of cocaine to smuggle into the U.S. By 1987, Sandra was working with Enadina Arellano Felix to smuggle cocaine using guest worker visas. Sandra persuaded Hanau to send even larger shipments in exchange for a discount. When the Guadalajara cartel collapsed in 1989, Anadina tried to bribe Sandra to leave Tijuana. Sandra refused and continued her operations, despite Anadina's attempt to stop her with corrupt cops. Sandra's resilience and cunning made her a top dealmaker for the Sinaloa and Norte del Valle cartels. Sandra lived a glamorous life as a cartel boss, amassing a fortune to buy 30 cars and a dazzling gold pendant with rubies, diamonds, and sapphires. Her fame even inspired a hit song, Fiesta en la Sierra, but her high profile brought danger. One morning, while heading to breakfast with her partner, Yoel, they were ambushed by gunmen. Sandra fell to the ground, fearing the end. Remembering her late brother and their mother's pain gave her courage. She escaped by hiding behind a bush and was helped by a kind stranger who gave her money for a cab. Sandra spent the next three years on the run before meeting drug trafficker Juan Diego Espinoza. Sandra always avoided leaving any evidence, but in 2002, her life changed drastically when her young son was kidnapped for a $5 million ransom. Desperate, she turned to the authorities for help. After rescuing her son, the investigation revealed over nine tons of cocaine linked to Sandra and her partner, Espinoza Ramirez. It took more than four years and 30 federal officers to gather enough evidence to arrest her. On September 28, 2007, Sandra and Espinoza Ramirez were captured in Mexico City. Sandra was found guilty of laundering billions from drug deals, though she claimed to be a simple homemaker with a small side business. Sent to Mexico City's Santa Marta Acatitla Women's Prison, Sandra's time there was far from harsh. On January 2011, a scandal involving unauthorized Botox treatments led to the dismissal of the prison director and hospital chief. By June 2012, Mexican judges decided Sandra could be extradited to the U.S. for cocaine trafficking charges. Sandra was extradited to the U.S. on August 10, 2012, and admitted to funding Espinoza's expenses. Surprisingly, all drug charges against her were dropped on August 20, 2013. Sent back to Mexico, she faced money laundering charges, was sentenced to five years, and was fined. Released in 2015, Sandra now lives freely in Guadalajara, transitioning from a woman born into cartel royalty to one who earned her crown through pageantry. You'll be amazed at how this next cartel boss managed her empire with such skill. Number six, La Señora. Clara Elena Laborin Archuleta was born on February 19, 1964, in Agua Prieta, Sonora. She grew up to be a stunning beauty and won the prestigious Miss Sonora pageant, a victory that changed her life forever. After her win, she was introduced to high society by Guillermo Francisco Ocaña Pradal, a well-known artist's agent. Clara mingled with celebrities, diplomats, and other influential figures, becoming a familiar face in the glamorous circles of Spain and Mexico. Her glamorous life took a dark turn in 2009 when the U.S. Department of Treasury named her a money launderer for the infamous Beltran Leva organization. Her close associate, Ocaña Pradal, was arrested in 2010, identified as a link between celebrities and dangerous cartels. Clara's entry into organized crime came when she married Hector Beltran Leva, also known as LH, a feared cartel leader. In 2008, the Mexican police made a big move by arresting Alfredo Beltran Leva, known as El Mochomo. This action started a fierce struggle between his brothers and El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel. LH suspected that El Chapo was behind Alfredo's arrest. Because of this, LH and his brothers, Arturo, Alfredo, and Carlos, 
left El Chapo's cartel and formed their own group called the Beltran Leva Organization, famously called BLO. This new group soon began clashing violently with their rivals. On December 16, 2009, Arturo was shot in a fierce battle with the Mexican Navy in Cuernavaca. Later that year, another brother, Carlos, was also caught by the police. After Arturo's death, LH took charge of the organization, which was getting weaker from attacks by the police and rival cartels. As if the arrests and violence were not enough, on April 13, 2010, Clara's world was shaken when she was kidnapped from her home by a group of heavily armed men. They blindfolded her and held her hostage, sending a picture of her looking disheveled and scared with a threatening message aimed at Hector. Remarkably, after 13 days of tense negotiations, Clara was released unharmed near the University of Sonora. Her kidnappers left a note declaring that they respected women and children, but were targeting men like Hector Beltran Leva. Imagine a woman who found herself in the middle of a very dangerous world, where violence was everywhere, and she had never been so close to real danger before. After that incident, the group went into hiding and reappeared in 2013, but their comeback didn't last long, and in 2014, LH was captured in a seafood restaurant and sent to a high-security prison. But then Clara stepped up to a huge challenge, keeping her husband's family's group alive. Clara wanted to prove that a woman could lead just as well as any man. During her time leading the group, she managed to hold on to their territories and built stronger ties with other cartels. However, not everyone was happy with Clara's leadership. A gang in Guerrero, known as the Independent Cartel of Acapulco, CETA, started a fierce fight with her group in 2016, turning Acapulco into a very dangerous place. Clara's name appeared on banners around the city as she led her group into battle. Her time as leader was short-lived, as on September 15, 2016, Clara was caught in Hermosillo during a big operation by the police and the attorney general's office. She was reportedly found with drugs and weapons. While Clara seemed out of place in that dark world, the next female underworld boss has this intense, thrilling lifestyle woven into her very DNA. Before we continue the video, let's have our subscribers pick. On your screen is a fierce woman with a smoky gun resembling a character straight out of fiction. However, the world has seen someone who fits this intense profile in real life. Even though this woman cannot be called the most dangerous female narco in history, J. Edgar Hoover, former FBI director, once described her as the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful criminal brain of the last decade. Born Arizona Clark on April 12, 1873, in Ash Grove, Missouri, Ma Barker was the notorious matriarch of the Barker Gang. Her four sons formed a crime syndicate infamous for their brutal activities and criminal exploits. The Barker Gang's reach extended so far that they even corrupted local law enforcement. Under the protection of corrupt police chief Thomas Big Tom Brown, they shifted to high-profile kidnappings. Their crimes included the successful abduction of two wealthy individuals for substantial ransoms. However, their luck ran out when the FBI started closing in on them. In January 1935, following the arrest of one of her sons, the FBI tracked down Ma Barker and her remaining family to a hideout in Oklahoma, Florida. In a dramatic and protracted shootout, the longest in FBI history, Ma Barker fought fiercely before meeting her end. Was Ma Barker truly the most dangerous female criminal boss ever? Or do you know of someone with an even more treacherous path? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Number 5. La Patrona In Ciudad Pedro de Alvarado, Guatemala, Myra Lemus prepared for an important lunch at the Los Cuernos Hotel. It was February 18, 2011, and Myra was running for mayor. She had invited key members of the community to discuss her plans and earn their support. The hotel was lively filled with chatter and laughter as everyone enjoyed their meal. But the excitement took a dark turn when two pickup trucks screeched to a stop outside. Armed men holding big guns and rifles jumped out of the trucks. Without warning, they began shooting. The room erupted into chaos as the attackers fired at everyone inside. Mayra and eight others, including one of her bodyguards, were struck down as they sat at their tables. Meanwhile, Marixa, Mera's younger sister, heard the terrifying sounds of gunfire from a distance. Determined to help, she jumped into her armored truck and sped toward the hotel. Her bodyguards followed closely, their horns blaring as they tried to warn her of the danger. As Marixa approached the hotel, the gunman noticed her and began firing at her truck. Bullets hit her windshield, making a loud, frightening noise. Marixa quickly reversed the truck and drove to the local police station, hoping for help. But when she arrived, the police, fearing for their safety, 
refused to assist. Returning to Los Cuernos, Marixa found that the shooting had stopped and the attackers had vanished. The restaurant was a mess of broken furniture and scattered dishes. In a back office, Marixa discovered her sister Mara. Mara had tried to hide, but the gunman had found her. She lay there, her face badly damaged and surrounded by a pool of blood. The tragic event is now known as the Massacre at Los Cuernos. Though the violence was shocking, some locals were not entirely surprised. Mara had a fearsome reputation, rumored to have committed past violent acts. Her story, full of darkness and mystery, is a grim part of the town's history. As Marixa looked at the remains of the once busy restaurant, she knew that the struggle for power in their town had turned deadly. In places like Ciudad Pedro de Alvarado and nearby Moyuta, local politics is like a dangerous game. By the time Mayra Lemus was killed, her family was one of the last two contenders for the mayor's position. Mayra's brother Magno had been the mayor until he passed away from a heart attack in 2009. Mayra was finishing his term when she was murdered. The day Mayra died wasn't the first time someone had tried to kill her. Back in June 2006, gunmen attacked a vehicle carrying Mara, Magno, and other family members. They survived, but their 17-year-old niece, Jennifer, and several others were tragically killed. Marixa blamed Roberto Marroquin Fuentes for Mara's murder. Marroquin was a political rival and one of the main suspects in the investigation, as he was also running for mayor that year. Marroquin denied any involvement and claimed that the Lemus family disliked him because he was popular. As expected, no charges were ever filed against him for Myra's death, and he even suggested that Myra's fate was due to her own choices. So Marixa decided to run for mayor herself. To boost her chances, she teamed up with Roni Rodriguez, another political and criminal rival of Marroquin. Rodriguez, who had also taken control of local drug routes after Magno's death, was seen as a strong candidate. But just months after Myra's death, Rodriguez was murdered in Moyuta in June 2011. With Rodriguez out of the picture, Marroquin won the mayoral race by a large margin. Marixa, upset by her loss and the continuing violence, allegedly tried to kill Marroquin three times. In November 2013, gunmen attacked his car, and a month later, a bomb was planted on a bridge he was supposed to cross. The bomb didn't go off, and the police involved in the plot fled, leaving behind weapons and a grenade. Despite these attacks, Marroquin was unharmed. By the time of the third attempt in November 2014, Marixa was already in prison, facing charges for kidnapping, murder, and even the death of her husband, charges she denied. In this final attack, Marroquin was injured along with his wife and bodyguard during an ambush by armed attackers. Meanwhile, Marixa is not having an easy time. She's known as Guatemala's female Joaquin El Chapo Guzman because of her dramatic prison escapes. In May 2016, Marixa managed to escape once with the help of other prisoners. Although she was caught quickly, she tried again in May 2017. This time, she escaped from the Mariscal Zavala military prison dressed as a guard and got picked up by a waiting car. Two weeks later, she was found in El Salvador with her hair dyed dark red, like her late sister Mara. Her escape became a major news story, even getting a tweet from President Jimmy Morales. Marroquin, who was closely watching, was terrified. A source from Ciudad Pedro de Alvarado mentioned that Marroquin was so scared he stayed at home, avoiding public events until Marixa was caught again. Marixa insisted she never tried to kill Marroquin, suggesting instead that he staged the attacks to make himself look like a victim. Presently, Marixa is willing to reopen her case to prove that she is innocent of all the charges that were initially levied against her. Continuing our look at fierce female bosses in Narcos history, the next leader embodies a mix of chaos, carnage, and, ironically, love. Number 4. La China Margarita Calderon Ojeda's life was filled with three things, drug trafficking, love, and death, but she had a fierce passion for the last one. La China wasn't just any criminal. She was one of the most feared leaders in the world of drug cartels. At one time, she was part of the powerful Sinaloa cartel, led by the infamous Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. But when El Chapo tried to demote her, she decided to betray him. She left the cartel, and created her own group to get revenge on her old boss and everyone who had wronged her. La China became notorious for ruling the tourist city of La Paz in Baja California Sur. She didn't just control drug dealing, she became infamous for her cruel methods of dealing with enemies. Her most terrifying act was dismembering her victims and leaving the pieces outside their families' homes, 
This earned her both fear and respect from other criminals. Under her reign, the violence in Baja California Sur exploded. Murders tripled in the seven years she led her group. Even powerful drug lords were afraid of her. The police tried six times to catch her, but she always slipped away. Lachina wasn't just ruthless. She was clever. She worked with another woman, known as Lagabi, to trick and kill their enemies. Lagabi would pretend to be drunk outside a bar, stumbling and falling with her skirt hiked up. When a man stopped to help her, Lachina would appear from the shadows with guns blazing. Eventually, her dangerous love story came back to haunt her. Her boyfriend, Pedro Hector Gomez Camarena, also known as El Chino, was one of her most trusted hitmen. But when he was captured by the police, he revealed some of her darkest secrets. He showed them where several bodies were buried, all victims of La China. Finally, on September 2015, La China was arrested in Cabo San Lucas while trying to escape. Even though her story is full of danger and violence, La China was eventually captured without a single shot fired. She was charged with over 150 murders and taken to a high-security prison. While the other women on this list took control after years of experience and maturity, the next lady on our list soared to the top at an astonishing speed. On her rapid rise, she left behind a trail of blood. Number 3. The Dane of Death Maria Guadalupe Lopez Esquivel, known as La Catrina, led a life that felt like a dramatic movie. Born into the perilous world of drug cartels, she became a feared leader before turning 21. Her nickname, La Katrina, was inspired by Aztec folklore, where the Dame of the Dead oversees the departed. While she wasn't a ghost, her reputation was equally chilling. Those who crossed her often met a grim fate. By day, Maria flaunted a glamorous life online, but by night, she commanded the brutal Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Her reign came to a violent end in January 2020 during a fierce shootout with the police. How did this young model rise to such infamy? Raised in Tepalcatepec, Michoacan, Maria was drawn to the world of crime and glamour from a young age. At 17, she left home to join the cartel, inspired by actress Kate Del Castillo's portrayal of a female drug boss in La Reina del Sur. The allure of the drug world was strong, though she didn't fully understand its dark and dangerous nature. Maria's involvement deepened when she fell in love with a cartel leader, Miguel LM2 Fernandez. Her relationship with him propelled her into the cartel's inner circle. As La Catrina, she didn't just lead, she commanded fear and respect. She was involved in everything from paying criminals to leading assassinations and kidnappings. By 2020, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel was a powerful force, valued at an astounding $50 billion. Despite the Mexican Army's efforts and competition from other cartels, the CJNG was relentless leaving a trail of violence and fear. Maria's story took a dramatic turn when police received a tip about her location. On January that year, a raid was conducted in Aguililla. The shootout was intense, and video footage captured the chaotic final moments of La Katrina. She was shot in the neck and was found injured and covered in blood. As she struggled to breathe, a police officer tried to comfort her, assuring her that help was on the way. Despite the attempts to save her, she died shortly after the helicopter took off marking the end of her fierce reign. The Dame of Death was fearless and boldly revealed her true self to the world. However, the next underworld boss faced her downfall the moment she stepped into the public eye. Number 2. La Flaca Born in the 1990s in the poor town of Tamaulipas, northeastern Mexico, Jocelyn Alejandra Nino, known as La Flaca, grew up in a tough environment. Her exact reasons for joining the Gulf Cartel remain unclear whether it was family connections or financial struggles. But by high school, she was recruited into the cartel. Starting as a lookout or Halcone, Jocelyn quickly proved herself. Her thin, young appearance earned her the nickname La Flaca, meaning the skinny one. Despite her youth, La Flaca became a feared hitwoman. Her role involved dangerous and brutal tasks, and her innocent look helped her deceive enemies. She mostly worked in Tamaulipas, targeting rivals from a faction called Los Metros. On January 5, 2015, a photo of La Flaca was leaked online. This mistake sealed her fate, as exposing a top Sicaria's face often means death. The photo spread quickly on social media, bringing her end closer. People couldn't stop talking about the picture of the petite woman standing confidently with a modified M4 rifle. She had a bright, friendly smile and wore a golden pendant outside her Kevlar jacket. Her delicate hands held the weapon with surprising ease. Her hair was brushed back neatly, and sunglasses rested on her head. Her arms were bare, 
showing a tattoo on her thin right forearm that read Nino, which means child. She became an easy target, not only for the police, but for the enemy gangs. On April 13, 2015, her luck ran out. La Flaca was sent by her leader, Citron Siete, to fight in the enemy's territory, Rio Bravo, and that was the end for her. Police officers found an abandoned truck in Matamoros, Tamaulipas. Inside, they discovered a terrible sight, a cooler with body parts, including a slender arm with a familiar tattoo, Nino. More of her remains were scattered throughout the city, along with two other victims, all members of Los Ciclones. It was clear that La Flaca had been tortured, shot in the head, and dismembered. Los Metros had done this, leaving a chilling message. This will happen to anyone who supports Los Ciclones. The final woman on our list embraced public life with remarkable boldness, despite facing threats from rival cartels and the government. She ruled over one of the largest cartels ever established, daring to stand in the spotlight, even with danger closing in from all sides. Number one, Mrs. El Chapo. In 1989, Emma Coronel Iceboro was born into a world of violence and drugs. Her father, Inez Coronel Barreras. Dicho los abogados, y es lo que me preocupa, este, pues, cómo va a llegar a un juicio bien si está mal de salud. Was a prominent member of the powerful Sinaloa cartel, led by the notorious El Chapo. Her uncle, Ignacio Coronel Villarreal, was also deeply involved in this dangerous realm and was known as one of Mexico's most feared figures. For her birth, Emma's parents traveled to Santa Clara, California, showing that they had the means to live comfortably in America if they chose to. However, they decided to spend her early years in rural Mexico. This arrangement made her a citizen of both the U.S. and Mexico, though it seemed more symbolic than practical. From a young age, Emma was recognized for her striking beauty. She won the Coffee and Guava Queen beauty pageant, an event that would change her life forever. It was at this pageant that she met El Chapo, who was 46 at the time. Whether it was love at first sight or something else, Emma's life took a dramatic turn. She married El Chapo on her 18th birthday in July 2010. Despite her claims of not knowing what he did for a living, El Chapo was already a notorious criminal and had escaped from prison in 2001. Although the attorney for El Chapo's wife didn't provide details of what financial issues may have snagged the sentencing, their wedding was attended by many influential people, including members of the Mexican army and politicians. Living a life of luxury, Emma Coronel Iceburo had no need to work. However, during her husband's absences, she often had to step up and take charge. In 2014, El Chapo was arrested again. Escaping from prison had become almost routine for him. He had famously evaded capture in 2001 by hiding in a laundry cart. In 2015, a tunnel was dug beneath the prison showers, leading to a property Emma owned, which facilitated his escape once more. However, his second escape was short-lived, as in 2016. He was captured in a dramatic raid and later extradited to the US due to his extensive drug empire. During El Chapo's trial in 2018, Emma became a media sensation. She captivated the cameras with her style and loyalty, even blowing kisses to her husband from across the courtroom. Despite hearing about her husband's violent crimes and affairs, Emma remained steadfast. She claimed ignorance about the cartel's activities and portrayed El Chapo as a simple businessman. However, text messages revealed a more complicated reality showing them discussing criminal activities as casually as everyday matters. With El Chapo behind bars, Emma's life changed dramatically. On February 22, 2021, she was arrested at Dulles International Airport. The FBI's arrest warrant revealed that they had evidence showing Emma had been passing messages between Guzman and Sinaloa cartel members. She was accused of helping Guzman escape from the high-security prison in 2015 through bribery and attempting to assist him in another escape plan after his recapture. The FBI's evidence included a handwritten letter from Guzman and statements from two secret witnesses who had worked with him. On June 10, 2021, Cornell agreed to a plea deal in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. She admitted guilt to conspiracy to distribute heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and amphetamines for illegal importation to the U.S., conspiracy to launder money and engaging in transactions with the properties of a significant foreign drug trafficker. On November 30, 2021, 
Judge Rudolph Contreras sentenced Emma to three years in prison. This summer in a cartel conspiracy, but mysteriously her DC sentencing date was just put off for one month. Followed by four years of supervised release. This sentence was later shortened to 31 months. Judge Contreras noted that she was a teenager when she married Guzman and had admitted her guilt. She served her sentence at the Federal Medical Center Carswell and was released on September 13th, 2023. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.